Foundation, the Tenure Facility, and the Tulsa Writers Foundation. Uh, this initiative promotes the importance of recognizing legal ownership of indigenous peoples and local communities' land rights as a prerequisite for achieving national and international goals for forest governance, food security, climate mitigation, economic development, and human rights. Uh, this land dialogue series will run across four webinars from May to November, with which webinar tackling a different topic. I'm Fabio Teixeira. I'm a journalist at the Tonsil Writers Foundation. Uh, today, we're talking about pandemic, social unrest, and war echoing in the Amazon. Recent global events have, ha have had dire impacts on the world's uh, remaining forests, particularly in tropical regions. Disease, outbreak, war, and social insecurity may have originated in other parts of the globe. However, their effects ripple and affect the most vulnerable regions and people. Uh, this ripple effect has brought unwelcome impacts that have become apparent in the Amazon. Despite these threats to the indigenous territories, hope does remain, which has been reflected politically in various countries in the region. For example, via the coming to power of Francia Marquez, the first Afro-Colombian vice president in the country's history. <clears throat> this is a monumental step in addressing inequality, as Marquez has been advocating for indigenous rights and racial justice. This webinar will thus reflect on global events which have impacted the Amazon region, but will place a specific accent on the solutions and progress for a more secure and a more secure future for indigenous populations in the Amazon region. I'm joined today by a terrific panel to discuss those issues. I'll hand over to each one of them for some opening remarks. We'll then have a discussion for about an hour and finally take questions from the audience, which should take us about uh, 90 minutes. Uh, the webinar will take place in English and be simultaneously interpreted to Spanish, French, and Portuguese. Uh, to access the interpretation, please see the channels located at the bottom of your screen. If you do have a question, please post them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and not the chat box feature. And I will then fill those questions to the panelists so we don't have to go through the all too familiar pains of people muting themselves and then muting themselves. Uh, feel free to tweet using the hashtag land dialogues and file live tweeting from land portal and tenure facility Twitter accounts. Finally, in the interest of transparency, I should add that today's session is being recorded and, and you will be receiving a link afterwards. Uh, I will introduce the, our uh, expert panel and ask them to talk about their experiences. Uh, first of them is Silvana Baldovino. She's a lawyer who graduated from the University of Lima with a specialty in environmental law and natural resources from the Pontif Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. She has, she has more than 18 years of experience in both the public and private sectors, designing and implementing public policies and strategies in different aspects related to the environmental issues of indigenous peoples, with an emphasis on the conservation of biodiversity and the promotion of innovative options for its sustainability. Currently, she is the director of Biodiversity and Indigenous Peoples Program of the Peruvian so Society of Environmental Law, an, an institution she has worked at since 2006. Uh, then we have Marcio Hala. Uh, he leads the Territorial Governance Facility, an economic indigenous governance project in the, sorry, so, oh, start that again. Uh, Marcio Hala leads the, the Territorial Governance Facility and Economic Indigenous Governance Projects in the in Latin America for Forest Trends Communities and Territorial Governance Initiative. Uh, prior to joining Forest Trends, Marcio was implementing several sustainable development projects, working closely with traditional communities and indigenous peoples in the Atlantic Rainforest and Amazon region. Since 1997, he has actively managed uh, projects on agroforestry, organic agriculture, sustainable forest value chains, community-based ecotourism, and forest management, man, management and certification. Uh, he, he graduated from Sao Paulo State University in agronomy and has a master's degree in territorial planning from Santiago de Compostela University in Spain. Uh, then we have Alexandra Narvaez. Uh, 
she is part of the indigenous part of the I. I sorry if I pronounced that wrong. I co-fund community of Sinago. As an indigenous person, she takes care of the territory alongside her community. She is also president of the Shamekpo Women's Association working very hard to achieve the dream of living a free and unpolluted legacy for the children. Sorry if I mangled uh, the pronunciation there, Alexandra, of several of your titles. Uh, Astolofo Aramburu is an african colombian leader from the Urumangi River and is part of the process of Black communities in Bogota. Aramburu recognizes the importance of, of Law 70 in the recognition of Black communities as collective subjects of law and the impetus it has given to the mobilization of organizations in Colombia. It also analyzes how the peace negotiations have affected the Black communities. And finally, we have Barbara Fraser. Barbara is a freelance journalist based in Lima, Peru. With 20 years of, ex of experience in Latin America, she puts a human face on current events and public policy. She offers research, writing, editing, and photography services with particular expertise in environmental, public health, and social issues. Barbara is a member of the Society of Environmental Journalists, the National Association of Science Writers, and the Foreign Press Association of Peru. Okay, now that everyone's introduced, let's start. Uh, Alexandra, let's begin with you. Uh, various threats have been presented to indigenous territories in the last few years, from COVID-19 to the war in Ukraine. In Ukraine. Can you tell us about the situation within your community with regards to land rights and how this has changed in the past few years? Good morning. Here is still morning. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Alexandra. I am from the ICO Find Sinae in Ecuador. I am a defender and advocate, a mother. There, I come from nature itself. Therefore, to tell you a little bit how it has changed since COVID arrived, since all these diseases, big diseases came to our country, to our territories. Well, we have lived, we lived in a healthy territory before where we raised ourselves running around, uh, washing ourselves in the river without any threats. And now currently in these last few years, we see ourselves threatened with these extractive um, companies of timber as well. In this last year, in our my territory, we have seen threats be in by the mining companies because because due to due to COVID, we couldn't go to work, and lately our territory has suffered a lot of destruction. In this case, because of the mining extractive activities, because they didn't have any job, they crossed towards our territory. They were looking. Um, looking for food damage in our own river, putting traps in our river to uh, catch animals. So we feel hugely impacted because we couldn't leave our houses um, freely. We couldn't leave our kids to go and, sh and have a shower or bath in the river because there are a lot of people, unknown people in our territory. And now, However, this also helped us to strengthen ourselves as a community. And we were able to organize ourselves to do rounds. We're doing these rounds to strengthen and to take care of our own territory and to leave and check the, the area. And with this crisis, we understand the situation, we, but we want every, everybody else to understand and to respect our territory, our waters. We don't want to communicate uh, contamination or pollution in our rivers. This has been very hard in our communities and for the indigenous communities um, that has suffered so much lately. 
we had to deal with it. We had to strengthen ourselves to to come to learn communication strategies and to grab our phones and cameras and to record those uh, evidence uh, materials. We as women also, we feel greatly impacted and threatened. We felt alone because the state itself wants to steal from us also by giving some um, permits to the mining companies without our consent. And we felt alone practically because a state has to, must defend or be an advocate for their for our rights. And it's not the case. They haven't uttered any word about it, about our territories, about our rights. Uh, rights. And we as a community had to stand up with a lot of strength and power and we as women, besides of all the fear and nervousness, we have to learn how to say that our territory is our, is our life and has to be respected. Our territory is our mother earth, has to be respected. And that is why we as indigenous communities, we are raising our voices and standing up and we say to all the world, because this problem is not just for the indigenous communities, this is a problem for, um, because without territories, we won't be able to live. This is, this applies to the entire world. Everybody's endangered and the future is endangered. Without territories, the whole world will be destroyed. There will not be a future for kids and we very strongly go and become an advocate for our territory and for our earth and for our rights to be respected in our modes of living so we can be as we did before we can leave our homes without feeling fear we can drink the water without feeling fear but here we are and we continue with this script that it's our territory, it's our decision and the, the, the community is here to continue with the fight for our lives, for our territory and for the Mother Earth because this depends on us. The respect towards Mother Earth re depends on us and also the respect towards our indigenous communities. And also we're being threatened by the same government itself here, the Kofan people is a natural reserve, but the government doesn't even take care of it. That is also why people are coming into the territory without our even consent, without our permission. And we are asking the government to have our the, the land rights. We are requesting that to have the to provide entitlement for lands as well because we need to demonstrate with paperwork that this is our own territory and we are having that fight. We are demanding our rights and the, entitle the entitlement of our land. So we strongly can say, this is our territory. You must respect it. This is the earth of everybody. That's, that's what we are saying as leaders, as community, as Kofan peoples for our rights to be respected. And the life to be respected as well because without the earth where are we going to live and that is my feeling my thoughts this is what i wanted to share thank you so much thank you so much alexandra uh Marcio, now we move to you uh the war in Ukraine has caused uh, serious disruptions uh, to the global timber trade, and these impacts are echoing the Amazon rainforest. Uh, the Brazilian government has claimed that allowing mining in the Amazon and subsequently in indigenous territories could end Brazil's dependence on imported fertilizers from countries such as Russia and Belarus. Can you tell us more about this? Yes, of course. Thank you, Fabio. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. So we have many languages here. 
I can add uh, a, a, a bit of uh, German um, and, and also, so forgive me, Dutch, because there are 300 uh, languages in the Amazon, indigenous languages and five European languages. Dutch is uh, one of them, of course, from Suriname. And this is part of this incredible socio and biological biodiversity of the Amazon, which for, for 500 years has been threatened. These threatened uh, threats have been faced by local communities and indigenous peoples historically. And we are witnessing in recent years, these tensions, these conflicts um, becoming more intense because of the context of the pandemic, the Ukraine war, and so the the forest borders are extremely conflictive and tense at the moment the, the forest frontiers i should say and this setting of tension has been worsened due to the context we're experiencing here in brazil of the sort of the disassembly of institutions, the gutting of institutions and the guarantees of rights. So unfortunately, lamentably, it's uh, we had to go through this dramatic uh, situation in recent years with a government such as the one we have right now, which works precisely to do away with the guarantees of rights to weaken institutions to destroy the systems of management and environmental control and so government that was elected stating we will not demarcate another centimeter of indigenous land they said so openly and said they were going to do what they ended up doing which is to degrade to destroy the systems of environmental enforcement and public participation, consultation and consent of indigenous peoples and traditional communities. And this is something that was already fragile before and became even more difficult. And this uh, is expressed very clearly by the Minister of the Environment of the current government who said in a ministerial meeting in a cabinet meeting that the pandemic was an opportunity to uh, really um, while everyone's attention was focused on the pandemic to really gut the environmental legislation and he phrased it as uh, um, the herd of cows uh, of cattle can go through the the, the farm gate um, so even before the current government took over, uh, there was a decade of reduction of deforestation in the Amazon. Between 2003 and 2012, the rate of deforestation was reduced by six times. And from 2016-17 to the present, this situation was reversed with an exponential growth and constant growth in the rates of deforestation which made it much more complicated for communities and indigenous peoples to be able to tackle the pandemic uh, and to and with a worsening of the food security situation so there was a lot of uncertainty a lot of difficulty for people to uh, maintain their ways of life so the current government has worked intensely to made made a constant effort to regulate certain activities in indigenous lands so for example we know how much illegal activities such as uh, logging such as gold mining and diamond mining small scale uh, mining also agriculture especially ranching are directly associated to um, land um, lease and land grabbing. And so we are witnessing uh, bills and legislative efforts to try to regulate all of these things. In other words, to legalize them and also to regulate large scale hydroelectric 
power generation and mining within uh, indigenous lands. It's in the constitution, but has never been regulated. And the government has been doing its best precisely as the minister, the, the minister of the environment said to, to make <laughs> the cattle herd go through the gates. In other words, to um, free up all these uh, activities. And we've been doing our best with the judiciary to uh, put the brakes on these uh, activities. So when the president says these things, regardless of it being passed as law or not, it sends the signal people involved in these illegal activities feel emboldened, feel empowered, um, that they have the authority to the moral authority to go into indigenous lands, invade them and enhance their illegal activities. So precisely, with the issue of fertilizers, it's interesting to say something about this because in 2020, the government, the current government, put a bill to Congress to authorize mining in indigenous lands. And in their words, the Ukraine war was an opportunity to approve this bill, to pass this bill in Congress. And so it was. Uh, presented to Congress with an expedited uh, system, talking about the importance of potassium for Brazilian agriculture and agribusiness. 85% of fertilizers used in Brazil are imported from Russia, mainly from Russia. And so the argument used by the government was that, that we needed to uh, be able to mine potassium uh, and a lot of the uh, indigenous lands had deposits of potassium. And so outside of the Amazon region, the potassium reserves that we have, we have enough until 2089, 78% of these reserves are outside of the Amazon region. And what is inside the Amazon region, only 11% are inside indigenous lands. So this means that beyond 2089, if we explore these ores in the Amazon region, we can have another 11 years until 20, 2100. So, and in this century, only 1% of the demand would be from indigenous lands, but that doesn't matter for their argumentation. They want to use these arguments to put into practice, to put into effect their plan to uh, bring indigenous lands into this, uh, into this uh, mining system. So for to mine indigenous lands. So I have a more specific question about the data that is there is out there about how mining is affecting indigenous territories. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, with pleasure. The issue of mining is important to differentiate that there is large-scale mining, like we heard Alexandra talking about Ecuador. We know that in Ecuador and Peru, the impact of mining activities, particularly regarding oil and gas and how they affect uh, indigenous lands. In the Brazilian Amazon, it's a little different. Um, it's not the same reality. We have major mining projects that impact directly on indigenous lands, but they are uh, that they are outside. They cannot mining cannot be licensed in indigenous lands, but outside of indigenous lands, but also in the Amazon. Yes, there are many uh, indigenous people that are effect, that are affected, nevertheless, and so they are involved in the conditions of the licensing of these. Um, mining projects. So that's a reality. But I want to devote more uh, attention to the increase in small scale mining, mainly for gold. We, we have data that shows that in 10 years, the small scales mining increased by five times. In other words, 500%. It existed before, of course, it's a reality that indigenous peoples are familiar and have been dealing with for some time. But after 2017, 2018, this 
exploded and it was greatly uh, enhanced. So the structures of enforcement of inspection were destroyed. And with the pandemic, the indigenous peoples shut themselves off in their own territory. And in a context of extreme food insecurity, of major difficulties and challenges, they had to also face this increase, tackle this increase in the invasion of their territories because of this disassembly of the enforcement agencies. A very emblematic case with major repercussions all over the world is the case of the Yanomami people. In three years, their, the, the amount of gold mining in their territory uh, tripled and that uh, that directly affected half of the people, the Yanomami people, about half of the population was directly impacted by this increase. Something similar of the Munduruku people in the Tapajós River Basin, that was even more intense, the increase there. And this type of mining, the Bolsonaro government passed a bill in Congress to authorize small-scale mining gold mining in indigenous lands. This is a polemical subject with a lot of um, institutional fragility. And there's no licensing, which it, they use mercury to separate the gold from other ores. I live in the Tapajós region myself, and I've been com contaminated because of uh, of eating fish that was that had uh, mercury in it and so i've become a vegetarian because of that so it's dramatic the situation and it takes place with any kind of effort to restore to recover to reforest so just to conclude my answer i want to stress that in the last 30 years more than 1 million hectares of vegetation native vegetation have been lost in Brazil. And 1.6% of that was inside of indigenous land. So I want to stress the importance of the indigenous ways of life and the governance capacities of their territories that the indigenous peoples have, and that must be re uh, recognized. And so in this context of climate change, a major uh climate change happening globally it's very important that this should be seen as an opportunity to recognize the role of indigenous peoples and ensure that their governance their territorial governance can be strengthened thank you very much fabio thank you Martin. Uh, so, so just uh add to our panelists and myself uh would, if we can like slow down a little bit just uh just so the interpreters can catch up. Uh, but uh, thank, thank you, Marcio. Uh, Astolfo, let's go to you. Uh, can you tell us uh, how the territorial rights of Afro-Colombian communities have been affected by the major political geopolitical shifts in the last few years? Uh, feel free to add on to what your colleagues have already shared. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. First of all, I think it's important to say for the context is that for the Black community in Colombia, from 1,852, Slavery was prohibited. And until 1991, the black community, it's the time when it was recognized and their rights, their constitutional rights. So 170 years passed after the end of the slavery without the black people having their constitutional rights, their collective rights. So from that moment, we are talking about 1991, 1991. So from then we have had 31 year, years 
with the recognition of constitutional rights for our communities. The Constitution of 91, the current one in Colombia, recognized that Colombia is a pluriethnical country, also the right to equality, It also recognizes the people who have been invisible, the vulnerable groups. So all this appears in the Constitution of 1991. And in that Constitution, there was just one article for Black people, number 55. And what we see in that article is that the government had two years to make a law recognizing the rights of the black communities. So the constitution is the beginning for that. So in 1993, two years after that, it's the moment where we have the law of black communities, the law number 70. So we have been talking, we haven't been talking of 30 years, but it was after 1993, when we have a right that recognizes our rights. And the law 70 that I mentioned before recognizes the land that in an ancestral way, we have occupied the black communities. And it says that those lands should be of their owners, of the people who live there. So in 1995, we have another law for that. And we have the process of recognizing the land. Then in that context, we create the politics that recognizes our land. We are talking about 1995. So we are not talking of 29 years, but 26, 27 of territorial rights. If we continue taking out some years, that process was created on 1995, but we didn't have the money to start functioning. So it was in 1997, more or less, and 1998, when we have the resources and it starts being implemented, the rights of the black communities. So from 1998, we are talking of 24 years of this politics, this legislation of the territorial rights of the black communities. These 24 years, we can also mention some problems that we have encountered, some rules that they didn't ask the people about that. And finally, they had to be rejected. So that rules, in the end, we couldn't implement them. So there was, there was a pause in the implementation of the politics. So I'm talking about this because I want to make sure that you understand that we have been fighting for that for many years, for recognizing our rights. In the Pacific region of our country, Colombia, is where major steps have been taken. And there we have 5.7 million of hectares recognized for the Black communities. So we have moved forward. However, 
we have to remember that black people arrive in a slavery situation and in the beginning they occupied all the country in the Pacific region that I have just mentioned, but also in the Andean region, in the Caribbean region, and also in the Amazon region, but it's especially in the Pacific region where we have reached some something. We still have to work in the other regions of the country where there are also many black communities. So in that sense, this is the first and most important challenge but I also want to mention that the law number 70 doesn't just refer to the rights, the territorial rights, but also it's a main law regarding the environment, the mining resources, the cultural identity and personal development. So these are the elements that I have just mentioned. They haven't moved forward in these 20, 30 years in our political life as black communities in Colombia. As a follow up to this, I would like to know what has been the impact of uh, Francia Marquez uh, being made recently the first Afro-Colombian vice president. Uh, can you tell us more about the opportunities that this shift brings? Perfecto. Bueno, eh, Francia Márquez. Francia Márquez is for us, is the mirror of a very important part of the Colombian society. Francia Márquez is a woman. She's poor. She's mother. She got pregnant very young and she had to work in the domestic service to get some money and it was it's very difficult her path. She could finish her studies. She's discriminated and she grew in the periphery of the society. So her case is very important. It's very beautiful for everything that has happened with her and her life. Her case, however, is the case of the majority of the people in Colombia. So that's why I say that Francia is a mirror for many of the Colombian people who see themselves reflected in that reality, in Francia's reality. So the popular sectors of the society of every cities in Colombia, cities very poor, and in the main cities where economy has been concentrated, the economy of our country in the periphery part is where the popular sector lives. So they continue to be this popular sector, the vulnerable people and also the people in the countryside see themselves reflected in Francia, the indigenous people, the black people, we all see ourselves identified in Francia's life. The young people, even the LGBT community see themselves reflected in Francia. So there it's a very beautiful case of how things are changing our reality is changing and for the first time people can see themselves reflected in the government the people the base of the society in colombia yesterday i was hearing the news and colombia has the third place of the more corrupt countries of the world and this corruption is an historical thing. 
and it's the one that has stolen the dreams of our people. Corruption is what hasn't allowed the, pro the progress The resources disappear and get lost. So we don't get opportunities. So the development that we have lived has ignored the interests of the community. So the interests have been extraction, mining, projects of big infrastructures or moving different goods, but they ignore the dreams and the projection of the community. What do we get with Francia? So for the first time, we have the opportunity that these dreams these bets, these visions, different visions, they can see all these reflected in a country model. It's the first time that left-wing government, that we have a left-wing government in Colombia and we have much hope. Last week I saw in Twitter that the vice president for the first time meets the women partera from Colombia. And I was very sad to see the comments on Twitter because people don't value this, they don't understand that because what they only know about medicine, it's the occidental medicine and we don't value what we know. So this is just one example. This government is giving visibility so to these bets that have never had these opportunities so we are working to get good results with that Silvana, let's go to you uh, from the legal perspective uh, what do you think are some of the challenges uh, but more importantly the opportunity that that exists in the amazon region right now when it comes to addressing indigenous land rights. Hola, muchas gracias. Soy Silvana Valdovino de Perú. Eh, en el contexto Hola, de... buenas, muchas gracias. So there are many subjects that are challenges for us. Basically, the pandemic in Peru brought the corruption and incrementation of corruption, illegal activities in indigenous territories. Also the prices of oil and gas have been incremented. And this puts in risk the indigenous territories. So the challenge is that we need to have more security, to have more rights, to bring those rights to the community and to protect that territories. In recent years, with the pandemic and all these global contexts, there are many advocates, environmental advocates who have been murdered in the Amazon. And most of them are indigenous and regarding subjects of uh, territory. So in the legal context, we need to protect these rights, give more rights, help the to, to manage that territory. And then also in a general way, we have to, to get legal context to manage and to protect ourselves of corruption. So we need to get this justice and we also have to change of vision we can just get rid of the poverty and we can use the natural resources in a sustainable way so this is the way in which we see it the indigenous communities uh, 
the indigenous community suffered a lot with the extraction and Astolfo was mentioning it because also because of the of not knowing mechanism of health we didn't know how to protect ourselves also regarding education so the the communities started to protect themselves to close themselves and so we need a national mechanism a strategic vision to protect the amazon region and to empower our communities and to have more tools to manage the territory so in the legal context we have a lot of work to do so the challenges they are major challenges mostly now with the illegal activities and murders to the environmental advocates let's move to you barbara uh, as we mentioned at the start of the webinar, uh, we would like to spend the bulk of our time today focusing on opportunities and solutions. Uh, Barbara, we know that you have an immense amount of solution reporting, uh, immense amount of solutions reporting expertise in the Amazon. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your about how land rights and indigenous people in the Amazon uh, has evolved the last in the past few years? using uh, this solutions journalism lens sure thank you very much first for uh for the invitation and warm greetings good morning good afternoon good evening to all from lima peru where i am based um first just to clarify what the term solutions journalism means it's it's basically it basically means um examining when when writing stories that raise issues that raise problems, examining also the solutions that have been implemented in efforts to address those problems. So it's not just talking about proposed solutions or possible solutions. It looks at actual things that people are doing on the ground and um, and examines what works and why it works, but also what the limitations are and what the problems have been. And it looks for insights into how others might be able to learn from those experiences or implement them. The idea is to spread around, uh, spread, spread the word about, help spread the word about some of these solutions. But I'd like to take a step back and look at the roots of some of the issues that I think need to be examined more closely through this kind of lens. Um, in 2018, I visited the Tigre River in Northern Peru, which is in one of Peru's largest and oldest oil fields, and talked to the women there about what they remembered from when the oil companies first arrived in that area in the 1970s. And it was interesting, when I asked men what they remembered, they tended to remember, the answer tended to be, well, the, the engineers, the, the oil men came and either they offered us work or they didn't offer us work, depending upon the situation of the community. But when I asked the women, they said things like, I was down at the river washing clothes and these strangers came out of the forest. Or I was in my home and this strange thing came down from the sky, this helicopter came down from the sky and I was afraid. And then after the oil drilling started, it's the women who gather, who collect the water, who wash the clothes, who wash their children in the, in, bathe their children in the rivers. And this was a time when Peru did not have environmental legislation. Oil spills just washed down the rivers. They were not contained or cleaned up. The hot, salty produced water that comes out of the well with the oil also just went down the river. And in a little community called Vista Alegre, sometime in the 1980s, um, something happened. I had heard that there was 
sort some sort of epidemic that happened. And I wanted to hear the story from, uh, from one of the women. So I asked about that and she took us, she took us across the river into the forest where the cemetery used to be. The person who had first told me about this told me that he had gone in the 1990s and had seen many small graves in the cemetery. And when we walked into the forest to where the cemetery used to be, because after this event happened, the community moved out of that place, we could feel the little depressions in the earth. And um, Lindaura Chuche, the woman who, who led us, stopped. She followed a path that we couldn't see into the forest and she stopped beside a, a very simple grave marker, just a stake, a carved stake in the ground. She put her hand on it and she said, this is my first daughter. And there she told us that there had been a day when the lake that they, where they fished and where they, where they fished mostly turned black with oil and oil came down the stream that led from the lake to the river. And sometime after that, the children in the community became ill. They vomited, they vomited blood and within a day or two, they died. Almost all of the children in that community died in this epidemic that may have, it might've been hepatitis, it's hard to say, it's hard to say what this, this, this many years afterwards, it's hard to say what the effect of the exposure to that pollution would have been. But she told us this story and she put her hand on the marker and she said, this is my first daughter. She would be 35 now. And it still breaks my heart when I think of that because there, are, there is this historical trauma in the Amazon region that dates back, probably dates back to the arrival of European settlers. But there have been very, very brutal incidents. Um, the slave trade that Estolfo mentioned, um, you know, he's, he mentioned the rights of the, the struggle of Afro-Colombians to, to gain their rights. And the intergenerational trauma of the slave trade is something that really hasn't been examined in Latin America, I don't think. In the Amazon, there's the intergenerational trauma of the genocide and the uprooting of communities from during the rubber boom era. And more recently, the oil industry, the extractive industries, oil, mining, logging, all of these things have multi-generational impacts that really haven't been explored. And they have a lot to do with land rights and they have a lot to do with, with persistent colonial attitudes toward the use of land in the Amazon that's related to the land trafficking that's going on, the land speculation, the mining, um, the, the wildcat gold mining, the illegal gold mining. And, and these, newer, um, these newer proposals for bio, you know, bio, uh, for a bioeconomy, for example, an, an economy based on, on non-timber forest products or, um, or carbon schemes, carbon credits using, using uh, offering carbon, carbon offsets, especially in indigenous territories. I think a lot of gains have indeed been made. Um, indigenous people now have a seat at the negotiating table for um, bio, on the biodiversity convention and on the um, the climate the climate convention. But they also complain that their proposals aren't necessarily being heard, particularly proposals that have to do with land rights and with um, and with demarcation of territories. There, there is a recent study that shows that indigenous lands and well, there are a lot of studies that show that indigenous territories and protected areas, officially pro uh, national protected areas or regional parks or whatever in the Amazon tend to be better protected than areas outside of them. And indigenously, and so that's definitely a gain. Indigenous people are protecting their territories, uh, continue to protect their territories against encroachment. 
but the encroachment is constant. And as, um, as Silvana mentioned, resisting it can be deadly for the people whose territory, who are trying to protect their territories. And often it, these kinds of this encroachment of agriculture or of mining or of logging leads to, um, leads to conflicts within the communities because some people in the community might be in favor or might be related to the people who are trying to encroach and others are, are resisting. So there, there are a series of, of gains and losses. There, there are places where I think there's, there has been progress. There's been progress in free, in free prior and, conformed in, in informed consent, for example. But there are also limitations. There are also, there's an unevenness in the way that those, con those consent processes are being implemented. So I think all of those are things that need to be examined more, more carefully, not just by policymakers, but also by the media. I think there's a lot to be looked at in these, in these, these areas. Um, the carbon schemes in particular are often, you know, they're often presented as a way of, of providing an income to indigenous communities. And yet in, there, are, there are researchers who are also raising questions about how well the benefits are distributed within the communities and even whether the benefits reach the communities. And indigenous leaders themselves are divided about those kinds of things. Indigenous leaders also point out that while they are protecting their territories as well as governments are protecting their protected areas, the protected areas receive an income, receive a budget, budget funds, but the indigenous territories do not because uh, the, their, the protection level is the same, but there's no support for that protection. So I think there's a lot of room there to look at what, what other kinds of protective schemes or what other kinds of financing would be possible for, for indigenous territories, for indigenous people and Africa and, and Af Afro communities, which are largely in, in Colombia or in, in the Colombia and Amazon and then other parts perhaps. Um, no, Colombia and, and Brazil certainly. You know, what other kinds of financing mechanisms could make it possible for those communities to help protect their forests? Um, the same with the bioeconomy, the whole, um, that whole Amazon 4.0 proposal now to, to help communities support themselves with bio, you know, bio, bio businesses, bio business opportunities, using products from their forests, things, things that could be biopharmaceuticals or, or um, foods like acai, for example. But again, these things have, or they raise a lot of questions about how well the, how equitably the benefits reach the communities. And even things like acai, which is a great uh, success story. That's the fruit, the palm fruit from Brazil that became a big export crop. But there are signs that the, the, excessive production, the excessive focus on producing acai has actually changed forest compositions in places where, where farmers are doing that. Um, so I think there are a lot of questions. There are a lot of places, there are a lot of questions that are being raised. There are a lot of things that are being tried that merit examination through the solutions lens. And I hope more journalists will, um, will take the opportunity to do that. And I hope that there will be more reporting grants available for, there are some now, but there, that there will be more in the future because I think with the, the uh, agreements that came out of the Glasgow Climate Summit, if they are actually implemented, there's gonna be a lot of money pouring into some of these projects and they definitely need to be examined. They need to be examined by scientists, but they also need to be examined by the media. There needs to be an eye on them. And the wild card in all of this for me is organized crime. During the pandemic, criminal activities expanded throughout the Amazon the illegal mining, the illegal logging, and drug trafficking. They're all related, they're all related with, to money laundering, and they're all related to corruption in the governments. 
And that's something that I think needs to be talked about a lot more. It takes a lot of courage for journalists to, to look at those because it's ex those are extremely dangerous issues to investigate. But unless, unless there is you know, a region-wide effort to attack corruption and attack organized crime. I think in a lot of places, it's the local communities that are just going to be caught in the crossfire. And that I think is a topic that needs a lot more discussion. Yeah. So that's, um, those, are the, those are the things that I would, I would mention sort of at, at first glance. <laughs> thanks, Barbara. Uh, thank, thank, thanks for this exposition. Uh, Alexandra, I want to go to you for us to finish up this first part of our conversation. Uh, can you talk a little bit about not only the other opportunities, uh, but what do indigenous communities need right now in order to come out from under these threats? Well, after hearing all of what has been said, we are on the front line, as I mentioned. Whoever who is uh, facing all these mining situations and oil company situations, we also had had a project to kick those companies out of our territory who weren't exactly inside the territory but were, were affecting the river we went and thanks to ngos and alliance saber alliance we have received support for the fight in our communities. And thanks for thanks to Amazon for Life who has supported us directly. They are working together with us. Us who are, it's we who are um, going through with uh, moments and we want the government to respect our territories and our rights. It's important because as the indigenous community, we must move forward and we must stand up and fight. And when we do that, we go to the streets, we must demand, we must even die in the protests that we have this year, in, in the protests that we have. In June, we had a protest and many of our friends died in that, in the fight against the government. Why? Because we had to fight for our rights so the government can respect them and us, we as indigenous community, we must die for this. So we have a little bit of attention from the government because our word, our voice is our strength, are our strength to continue moving forward and to continue taking care of our territory and the future for our kids. The government says that we are armed groups, but it's not true. We are advocates for our territory, for the jungle, and because the nature and the forests have rights also, but how can they defend themselves? We must do it for them as advocates for our territories. And in this way, we defend the future of our kids. It's it's awful that we don't receive support by the government, that they don't guarantee our rights or our lives, that we must go out into the streets and fight for it. And in this case, we know that Cayambe Coca Reserve is, is in our territory and we don't receive any benefits, money benefits from the government, considering that they have a um, economic reserve specifically, specifically for them. They don't support us with any projects. The, we do it ourselves. 
with our hearts because we want to leave a legacy inside the territory for our kids. We work in these projects without even receiving any wages. We go and we go through this, our territories and take care of it and guard our territory because we want to leave again a legacy for our kids. We speak about a lot of, a lot of climate change and, but nothing is being done. Nothing gets to the actual territories, to our communities. So we, as women, as indigenous women, Cofanes women, we try to come up with ideas of how to deal with this fight. And we have this idea too of creating the tourism pr project to explain that we, as women, we can actually cr also take care of our territory and provide and show our culture, our food, our dances, our sacred places, our people, and take care of the people and the invisible people that are inside the territory that we can feel. So that is our project as a community and as an indigenous community. We try to look for projects that can support us as well to develop, but not mining projects or oil projects that it's only making our earth bleed. We want to be stronger with these big NGOs that have supported us. And this has been a huge, solely solid foundation. They deleted the 52 entities that, was dam that were damaging our territory. So now we are stronger and we're getting mm, stronger because there is a lot of pain due to the government because there are no projects and nothing. We hope we become stronger. I really thank these big NGOs that have supported us and so many other people from the communication er industry that are allied with us and are telling our stories and explaining the life inside the territory. I live here, I live day by day. I. I try to tell people that do not understand my life to try to respect it if they don't understand it. To understand the fear that we feel from these big companies that want to destroy the future of our kids and they are only thinking about create, making money, but we are requesting respect to Mother Earth. And that's what I want. with the indigenous law, with the community all together, because it is true that there are leaders that are sold. But in my community, we are not divided. We are together. And we want the future for our kids and we want to feel okay. We want to feel united. That is the basic foundation and we will always be the territorial advocates. And yes, there are threats to female advocates and female human rights advocates. We have Linda Maria, she's a lawyer who is an advocate for territory and she has worked with us. She has a fight, she has fought with us against mining companies and she's helping so many territories also, we raise our voices so the government can um, provide guarantees for the life of Lina as well. And we are here. Many indigenous peoples will fight for our earth and for the territories who are still the lungs of the earth. Thank you so much. Sandra, so uh, thank you guys for your participation. Now we are going to move to the questions uh, that the audience has. Uh, I'll start with one that uh, that is directed specifically at Astolfo. 
Astolfo, the listener is asking uh, how are Afro-Colombian communities organized to assert their land rights in Colombia? Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Sí, por supuesto. Eh, of course. Con, con la ley de comunidades negras que mencionó hace... With the, uh, the black law, the black community laws, there were some legal scenarios that were created for ethnical participation, ethnical community participation there for the Afro-Colombian peoples. They have representation in the Congress of the Republic and there is representation of them in different entities, nationally, regionally, and even locally. Um, it has to do with land access culture and with the main fundamental rights of human beings. Additionally speaking, as a movement, we have our own spaces of articulation nationally and regionally. Those are scenarios where we take our proposals and we try to do advocacy uh, to nationally speaking. And at this very moment, we're going deeper into, we're going into a new government who is, that is demanding us something. We have this challenge because we want to be well represented in the development plan of this um, of this government, the indigenous communities. We want participation and the participation, we want participation in different entities. And what we have thought and we have, and what we have seen for so long is the obstacles by the government in the recognition and the dialogue in those agendas. L lately, we haven't actually proposed any new agendas because what we are demanding is to abide by the agendas that were previously established in the past. We go back to the tables and due to a protest or a manifestation and or a march, and we go back to the tables and we request the same demands that we have always requested from the indigenous communities. And however, they are overlooked by the regional government. To sum up, at this very moment, we are articulated and we want the proposals that historically was were made in the past to be respected the agendas depend on economic resources, and we are also working on that as well. Thank you, Astolfo. Uh, the next question is directed to all panelists, but specifically also to Massio. So if Massio could start by answering, then we can hear comments from whatever panelists want to, to talk or to comment. Uh, so everyone, uh, do you believe that the growth of market approaches like community business, impact investing, carbon market, etc., can com can contribute to strengthen strengthening indigenous communities, black communities, in other groups in the Amazon. Marcio, if we can start with you. Sim, Fabio, agradeço. Thank you. Of course, we work in this uh, direction, in this sense with forest trends and in a network with many other organizations support organizations so we've been working precisely in this uh, aspect uh, particularly as commented by barbara with regard to the bioeconomy the socio biodiversity value chains so there is a huge potential there and lots of work to be done to strengthen 
the initiatives of uh, communities and indigenous peoples to make sh to ensure to ensure uh, that these uh, that this social business community business approach uh, is strengthened and the alliances with partners with the market players for these products to reach the market in other words to ensure good uh, negotiating conditions, long-term contracts, according to the values and principles of the communities involved. So there is a major need to level these relations with the market, strengthening the visions of the communities themselves, the indigenous peoples themselves, to make sure that these processes strengthen their internal governance as well, based on agreements, based on consent, on norms that ensure access to opportunities to all, to youngsters, to women, to make sure the territorial com com governance is strengthened. This is the direction we work towards. And regarding carbon, uh, uh, we think it's important there's a this market is not consolidated yet in terms of access and recognition of these communities and indigenous peoples that keep the forest standing uh, we also see that there's an importance in, in ensuring a flow of resources from public entities through agreements that ensure this recognition in, in other words not necessarily selling credits on the market Yes, the carbon market is an opportunity in a way, but there are other paths which are jurisdictional uh, paths, as was commented. So a lot of money has been committed since uh, COP26 last year, and surely in Egypt, this will be the reason of major attention. So how to ensure that these flows of resources, these billions, can really land on the territories, arrive effectively at the government, at the base level, at the grassroots level. So for example, like Alexandra said, they need the resources on the ground to continue controlling and surveilling their territory. Obrigado, Márcio. Alguém or maybe I know you have some uh, thoughts about this uh, topic, I guess. Um, no, I, I, I think um, I think Marcio has has talked about some of the the issues that need to be to be looked at and the, the issue of of equity in in benefit distribution, not just the benefits reaching the community, but the benefits being equitably distributed within the community. I know that there are some some studies that show that women women continue to be sometimes sidelined from from the benefits of some of these 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 things, and um, I think it's really important to remember that one size does not fit all, and that indigenous communities are not monoliths. Indigenous communities and Afro communities in the Amazon are not homogeneous. Um, people tend to think of the indigenous perspective on something or um, the indigenous way of doing something. And while there are common cosmovisions, there are differences of opinion among, among within these traditional communities, just as there are differences of opinion anywhere. And I think it's it's really important to be careful that these kinds of projects don't end up dividing communities that are already having you know, internal, that might already be having internal tensions. So I think that's, um, that, that's definitely something. And um, the, the, another thing that I, I didn't mention that that would possibly fit into this is also, we haven't really talked about how um, actors from outside the region can influence what's going on in the region. And there's, there's increasing uh, attention to supply chains, for example, and how consumers in the US or in Europe can influence, um, influence events on the ground in the in the Amazon by what they choose to purchase or what they and or how they insist 
to suppliers that they that they make their supply chains chains transparent. So I think there's a lot to be that a lot that can be done in that area too that can also help uh, communities on the ground in the Amazon resist some of these these outside um, these outside influences. Uh, I think you know I, th I think this. I think the whole issue of responsible con responsible consumption is something that that requires you know further further attention to whether that's you know how well these carbon offsets are really working or um, you know, where your where your coffee comes from or where your where your cocoa comes from or whatever. I think there's a lot more that could be done in that area to raise consumer awareness and get consumers to you know, to put some pressure on companies that can then have a positive impact on local communities. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Uh, now we have a question for all panelists. Uh, it's something specific that I feel like Alexandra can, can talk a little bit about. Uh, the question is how many acts and rules have changed during the pandemic situation in the interest of mining companies? Does anyone want to pick that up? Alexandra, maybe. Oh, is she frozen? Perdón, no escuché bien la pregunta. Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Could you repeat that one more time? The question is how many acts and rules have changed during the pandemic situation in the interest of mining companies? Um, han cambiado, pues, nosotros, how they have changed well as a community with our own guard our guard is moving around trying to guard our territory uh, with these mining companies there is always the presence of our own guard they have actually been able to minimize the access of these mining companies inside our territories that they did it without our consent and uh, without our permission. So our own self-determination have actually worked. It's not something that the government did. It, it was just a way that we did to defend ourselves, our own um, community guard has been there and we try to make our rules be respected and our rights as well. Yes, it is less now. There are so many projects that we were told that we are going to be um, passed, but we are watching over those bills and we will always be watching over our territory and again requesting that our lives have to be respected and we ask that the projects have to have to be have to be reaching the communities and as somebody said in base organizations because in this way we strengthen ourselves as women with the with our fights and guards it's a huge support to have projects that benefit our territories and our lives and to continue with this strengthening of our families and kids that are our future of life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Marcio and then to Astolfo. Thank you. In the case of the Brazilian Amazon, it is very clear. This pandemic context, as I mentioned before, was seen as an opportunity by the current government that has this, this idea of weakening this 
whole system, this was dismantled. There are studies that show, for example, environmental fines were reduced in over 70% during that period. They were compiled over 50 laws that made a licensing a lot more flexible. One of them, which was really serious, was the one I talked about before, relating to illegal mining of indigenous lands. But we can also talk about the great amount of agro-pesticides that were released by this government. There is a, a, a really well-organized strategy that is very systematic, authorizes of a, the flexibilization of rules regarding the authorization and use of pesticides in Brazil that were forbidden historically in many parts of the world. And now they're, they're being liberated. And that's why the Brazilian people is being polluted in a systemic way. And this is very related uh, to illegal to illegal mining. I'm really sorry because I was talking really fast again. Asolfo, uh, let's let's hear what you have to say. Asolfo, can you hear me? Sí, 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 escucho. <laughs> No, it's uh, you raise your hand. Uh, do you want to reply to the question? The question specifically was uh, how many acts and rules have changed during the pandemic situation in the interest of mining companies? Okay, sí, sí, estaba atento esperando. Que me yes, diga. I was waiting for the question. So what has been proven and we what we can see easily is that with pandemic, of course, the economic capacity, the revenues of all the world have been reduced in a country as ours, Colombia, The main part of the resources come from mining. So we give access again, we reactivate the economy and the government, what decides to do is we're going to strengthen the mining industry we're going to accelerate the production, the mining production to reactivate the economy. And this as a consequence has some implications, some environmental implications and human because it makes them more difficult and it's due to this political economy. So in the contrary, what the, go what the government doesn't do is that the economy of many families, countryside families, depends on the mining, but the artisanal minor, minery mining who practice not just the black people, but also other people. And that mining that was affected because of the pan pandemic. And the government didn't help this part 
of society. So this generates a big gap of the economic possibilities of one part of the society and the other. The big companies accelerate the enterprises, societies, we destroy the environment and we violate the human rights of many communities. Thank you so much everyone for your time and thank you uh, to, the, to the panelists. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up here. Uh, please note that today's webinar was the third of four in this year's series. The last and final in dialogue for this year will take place in early December, and we will share more information with you shortly. Finally, thank you to the teams uh, from the Lane Porto and the Tenure Facility for their, for their organization. Have a nice morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Thank you so much. Gracias. Muchas gracias.